And we're back. This is episode 504 of the Columbia Calling podcast. We've got a well, many time repeat guest on the show. You'll remember the end of last year, we spoke to Paula Delgado Kling about her new book, Leonor, the story of a lost childhood. And well, we are, we see a great importance in promoting these things and promoting books of this nature. And so Paula is back on and we're going to give further promotion, but also just have a bit more of a general conversation about everything Columbia related. So Paula in New York, welcome back on the Columbia Calling Podcast. Oh, Richard, thank you for having me back. <laughs> I mean, it's about the fifth time, I think, in 10 years you've been on, I think around that. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, way back in the day when you used to write, talking about Columbia. I did. I, I I might revive my blog talking about Columbia. There's a lot to be said. Um, well, it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It's exhausting. Yeah. But let's talk about it. So the book, you know, you followed Leonor, who was a, you know, a girl from an impoverished upbringing, uh, sort of, I would put it, put into sex slavery in the FARC, you know, made... Uh, the the mistress of a high-ranking gorilla, well, 34 or something years older than her. Um, and it's been a process to write this book. We've talked about it continually, but so is any book process, apart from if you're Ivan Duque, who seems to just bring them out every six months. Um, <laughs> but that said, you have been launching it you've had a launch in new york you've had a launch in florida have you had any other launches uh lined up um there are a few still in the works i'm going to be signing in uh boca raton this coming saturday wow um, what is this saturday february the third okay. at barnes and noble in boca raton in uh on glades road mm -hmm. um and there are a few others that we'll see. It's going to be launching March 6th or March 7th in the UK. Uh-huh. Okay. There you go. Um, so that should be exciting. And stay tuned on my uh, author website for future events. Where will it? Where will there be events in the UK? We're not sure yet. Okay. Okay. Well, very cool. You know, I mean, this is pretty amazing. Yeah. So you're going to rack up the air miles because I hope you go and attend some events there back in London. Yes, hopefully. But so much of it nowadays is done through the internet as well. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Yeah, there's nothing like there's nothing like being there. And how has the reception been? These first two, uh, these first two events. Why? Well, I mean, very different, very different markets. New York and Florida. So, so how has it been? Um, so in New York, it was really great. My graduate school, Columbia University, the International Affairs Program, SIPA, was really receptive to it. And they um, put it out online. And it was great to hear from people who I did not even go to school with, uh, <laughs> who'd been working on the subject of human rights and children and women's rights. Um, so that was really great. Um, so in New York, as these things happened, um, it launched last Tuesday, and it was one of those cold, dreary, rainy, ice rain New York days. Um, but still, a lot of good friends, supporters came up to the Upper West Side, Shakespeare and Company, and we had a great time. It was a great reading. It was very quaint. It was sweet. It was um, it was great because as I was reading, a few people walked by, and they stopped at the cashier and said, I want to get that book as I was reading, uh, but at least two of them had to run to the opera because Shakespeare companies right by the yeah. uh, by Lincoln Center. Yeah. <laughs> so the the store uh, staff interrupted the reading a little bit and said, would you mind signing these or off to the opera? <laughs> so that was great. I mean, for somebody to just walk by and say, oh, I, I want to get what she's reading. But I also have to go to the opera. So that was really fun. That was very New York-y. <laughs> yes, that's very New York. And then down in down in uh, Florida? So down in Florida, I read last um, last Sunday at in Coral Gables at Books and Books. I know it. And, uh, I don't know if you've ever been, Richard. It's this beautiful mm -hmm. store that takes up like a block. Yeah, it's huge. It, there's a cafe in the middle. It really has this old feeling of wanting to stay in there for 
forever looking at it. They have Spanish books, they have architecture books, art books, the latest literature, the latest nonfiction. And the staff there is really great. So that's the uh, Books and Books in Coral Gables. And, and the reading there was well received as well. Um, it was great. Uh, there was one woman who is a professor at um, Northwestern and University of Chicago. And she came, um, she's great. Her name is, I'm gonna tell you, her name is Constance Sheehan. And she's a professor who's been um, teaching human rights and, and trauma for a very long time. And she stayed behind and talked to me. And I wish I had met her earlier in the process of writing the book uh, because everything we talked about in of, of the uh, trauma of somebody speaking to you about their life mm. and amnesia and putting um, events into context and the date and such a young age and not having control of her narrative or whether uh, she the person has control of their narrative and a woman's role in it. I mean, it was fascinating mm. to speak to her. Yeah, I bet. I bet definitely, and I mean that's the great thing. A book of this nature does will draw in those, let's say, incredibly interesting people who can provide you with uh, a background that you were like, as you said, I wish I'd met her before. I, know, I wish I had. <laughs> One thing she said that I, I, I'm still thinking about. Is she said, "You talked a lot about corroborating the facts, which was really important to publishers and to editors and to my agent." that everything in it was factual and that I could back it up, which I did by the end notes at the back of the book. I think there's like 65 pages of end notes with footnotes of each fact of, well, this is actually really common because the study says that 25% of children who's been in this suffer this and all of that, and it has the reports. But she said something interesting, which was, yeah, but at what point does it really matter because if a person believes that that actually happened to them, then that's in their narrative and that's what they own and that's in their memory. So whether it happened in that actual way or it didn't, it's still the way she sees the world and her point of view. That's, that's really interesting. So an imagined, an imagined memory is as legitimate as a, let's say, a real one. I guess as a writer's point of view, right? Mm. Point of view, mm. like what lens you see it under, what takes you a little bit more time to think about and whether you stay in that place and time for a little bit longer and then all the other stuff takes a little bit of a backdrop to your memory. Also, I mean, you know, there was a there is a review, one of the blurbs up uh, from the Kirkus Review which is oh. amazing, you know, it says a devastating portrait of unspeakable suffering. And I think you put that into context, who are we to pontificate about what Leonor went through? Exactly. You know, uh, it's, it, as you say, unspeakable suffering that neither you nor I have ever uh, experienced and obviously are unlikely, touch wood, to ever experience. And and also her story it makes me think a bit of Henri Charrier with Papillon uh, you know he, it was later said that you know all of those adventures weren't his but he was able to put them down on the page you know, right he was able to and I think you know it, it's not exaggeration these things are happening were happening and will continue to happen unfortunately in a country with such inequalities and and such a, a a lack of sort of basic human rights around of course it's going to go on and so that that you have been able to detail this and put it down on the page is is i would say more important um i don't know how you feel it was really important for me to get the story right mm. and to get at the truth of it and to unwrap all the layers of what the story actually is. Um, and that's why it took me a very long time to write it and to give it perspective and distance. Um, 
I guess it co- it comes from my my journalism background that I wanted to carry on to 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 a book writing yeah. because in the end this is nonfiction. And will I mean will you be uh, will you be submitting excerpts here and there to magazines in in promotion of of the book? So I, I've been very lucky that through the years uh, I've had several acceptances to um, literary magazines that were great. Uh, Narrative magazine published an original excerpt. Oh goodness, I want to say like 2006. I don't remember. <laughs> then uh, the Literary Review published another excerpt, and then it got republished for their 60th anniversary issue, oh. which I was very excited about. Then Pacifica Literary yeah. Review. Um, published an excerpt and um, the grief diaries, which has since gone uh, defunct because that's what happens to literary magazines. Yeah, <laughs> but they also published an excerpt. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, going forward, uh, perhaps, maybe, but it's already out there a lot. And yeah. Taint, Taint magazine did a related piece. Okay, well, there you go. And of course. You are listed in L magazine. Yes, that was is super- huge. <laughs> is, was that a surprise? I was. I was <laughs> because um, I, I, I knew we had submitted to L. Um, we hadn't heard back from them, but also you don't hear back ever, do you? <laughs> so it was very surprising to get. Uh, an email yesterday saying, oh, look, you made it into the most notable books so far of 2024. <laughs> that was really exciting. It's some great, great books there. I'm very excited to read all of them. Great company. It's it's incredibly flattering. But of course, uh, you know, again, I haven't read it, but I know it's well received. My book is probably in Tennessee, as uh, you know, Amazon have not sent oh, it yet. Yes. But I pre-ordered. So there you go. So, so um, I, I don't know what this means exactly, but uh, there was a storm in Tennessee <laughs> and it delayed the supplier and it delayed, there is stock of the book. We're glad everyone who pre-ordered or wants to order, there is a book out there. Um, but the storm and Amazon suppliers and Amazon drivers, and there's a little bit of a delay, but it's on its way. I but know, it's yeah. also available on Bookshop. Barnes Noble, and um, anywhere really where books are sold. Oh, the idea, and that's, I mean, that's it's amazing, and and to see the blurbs that were written again that are up there is 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 really it's really incredible, and I I kind of feel that I've we've we've come up kind of traveled this journey a little bit together because I have been very aware of your work ever since we we first spoke and uh, you know and, and I remember conversations like we're gonna get that book published I, mean, I remember conversations of this nature um, uh, and was, now there you are <laughs> it was very difficult I I'm extremely grateful um to or books that an evergreen review the two of them in conjunction that they took a chance on it um, and I, I, yeah, I'm just grateful because a lot of publishers would have a hard time with the devastating portrait and grief and violence and all that grittiness that's in this book. That's someone's life. It's, see- it's perhaps maybe not for every reader not a beach read or perhaps it is for some i don't know perhaps it is for some (laughs) well i guess if you can disconnect you know if you can disconnect and go to the beach and then sort of plunge yourself into some literature i don't see why it it couldn't be a beach read i mean i i I think i read james joyce on the beach i would say that was a beach read but then i'm not normal so that's another story arms or yeah so uh, let's let's just let's just remind our listeners a little bit more about the book. So you followed Leonor nineteen years, but how did you get to this stage where you wanted to do a story about this? Because I think you had you were influenced before, and of course your upbringing in Colombia obviously influenced it as well. 
So um, when I was a graduate student at SEPA at Columbia University in New York, I started to write a policy paper about women and children, and there wasn't a lot of information about it. So I thought to myself, I'm going to go home and try to write maybe a little article about it. And that turned into 19 years of research. Um, I guess the initial, initial question was, I always heard women are the silent victims of Colombia's war. And as a woman myself, I wanted to know why. Well, so women are the wives, the girlfriends, the sisters, the daughters of the men who are active warriors. And often a woman's body is violated in, as a vengeance against her man. And that's very clear in the book. So that was one woman's rights um, question that I wanted answered for myself um, when I first began this book. Um, but Richard, it, it was all, it's also a very personal book because I realized this many years um, into writing this book, that I had gone in search of Lenore because when I was a teenager in uh, 1992, my oldest brother was kidnapped. And I didn't know anything about what had happened because it's not spoken about. It's what happens in Colombia, but no one speaks of it. <clears throat> to the point where in my family, it was referred to as, quote, the absence, during his absence. And you and I know the power of words and of naming something. Um, so <laughs> years into writing this book, oh Lord, I wanna say maybe six, seven years into writing this book, I was in a yoga class. It was a beautiful afternoon. The sun was going through the window and we were in Shavasana at the end of the class. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all lying there. Some people fall asleep, others try to calm their nerves. And I just began to cry and cry and cry and cry. But I didn't really understand why. And then it came to me several days later that I had gone in search of Lenore and child soldiers because all I had ever heard uh, was that my brother was held hostage by children, by teenagers. So in, in my mind, Lenore became to me a stand-in for my brother's captors and he and i were very close are still very close and i guess i wanted a shared experience and an understanding of what it was he had gone through mm -hmm. and how you can co cohabit and live with your captors in a small room for six months and see their humanities they see your humanity and it was the same way with the kinship that Leonora and I began to form. So, Which I'm very, very lucky that, I, I, I mean, she's amazing to have let me in, into her, her soul, into her fears, into what happened to her, into what she saw, into what she experienced. Um, for a woman from Bogota to gain access with my accent, I'm white, I'm blue eyed, I have a different dialect than a, a woman from Putumayo who's been in the FARC. It's really admirable and it speaks a lot to her and to a lot of people out there that she let me in. Because we talk about the politics of it and we talk about the politics of uh, the rehabilitation program and, uh, reintegration of families and we don't really know exactly how the political is so personal to everybody your your brother was held for six months and by by kids so from presumably people his same age or thereabouts younger and i just have to ask because i know my listeners will want to know was it in Bogota, in the outskirts, is it? You know, they help people in Suacha. It was Bogota, like northern Bogota. Oh, really? And yeah. does does he talk about it? Not really, because it's been so long, and it's just something that happened. And he's not the only one. I mean, what yeah. what's the statistic now, Richard? And people don't talk about it, right? 
Uh, it's increasing again, is what's happening. Yeah. Um, what I think that's so very interesting that you are now, you put Leonor into the position of your, again, your brother's captors. And so therefore you get to see with different eyes through Leonor's eyes, her life. It's, this is a very personal, as you said, and very emotional journey for you. And I'm, I'm curious as to how long did it take for Leonor really to open up to you, you know, earn you, you to earn her confidence? Well, um, let me see. I can look, I can tell you right now. So in 2001, when she was 17 years old, she said she had joined the FARC six months earlier. In 2013, she clarified, she joined the FARC formally at least when she was 11 or 12 years old and she remained in their ranks for five or six years. So I met her in 2001 and she only really started beginning to open up to me in 2013. 12 years later. I, I, it's not that we spoke all the time. It's not that I kept in touch with her every single day of her life. It's periodically every few months. I checked in with her, checked in with the story again and again and again to see if that was really the story that she still stuck to. There were a lot of details she talked about that are not in the book because I don't think they really happened because it wasn't something she mentioned uh, month after every couple of months so there was potential from her side there was potential embellishment of the story maybe to throw you off well so so uh it it's not n n well maybe but it's also because a lot of trauma victims have to embellish the story in order to survive yeah she spoke a lot about how she was the commander's top girl. But truthfully, a social worker say is every girl like that is the commander's top girl. And I mean, Leonor becomes a personality in your life. At any point did you think, I'm just gonna focus, well, obviously you did, but I shall only focus on Leonor because it's the voice of many. Or did you think I should get more voices of young women, girls who have gone through this as well? Um, I think it's two things. One is that it's very difficult to get a lot of voices to that in depth um, for logistical reasons of they lose touch of the uh, re rehabilitation program, so social workers lose touch with them. It was by a miracle that I was able to stay in touch with her or that now and then she had a cell phone that I could call and she could get that person's cell phone and talk to me. Um, logistically, that that's very difficult. Now, I, I would not have gone to Putumajo to look for her myself just because of the danger of it. Um, so we were able to keep in touch through Facebook, through email, through the, the, the telephone. And one of the great things about the telephone is that when she speak, when she spoke and told me these things, I, I could not telegraph in my face what, how horrifying it was what she was telling me. If you're on the telephone, you don't see the other person's reaction. So it's easier for you to just talk, 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 talk. I'm also not a person who's in her life day to day, who's not part of uh, her group, her community, her her family. So it's easier for her to just chat, <laughs> like to a stranger on the bus. Um, so for that reason, I think that that that's one of them, the logistical reason. Um, but two, I think her story just has so much wealth and detail and uh, devastation to it that it's enough i mean you have this this story of I mean, extreme sexual violence and of course i imagine there's the fear of re-victimization that she has to go through these issues again talking to you but at the same time you are possibly a sort of catharsis for her 
Exactly. Uh, uh, and again, you, that, I would like to think that you are not like very well known to her. So you are apart, like you said, apart from her social group. The information is going elsewhere, but privately. When you said to her back in the day, I'm going to put a book together, how did she feel? He, I, I told her right away in 2001. Um, I think, again, in the, in the victim and the trauma mode, um, she felt very much the protagonist. And her sense of being a protagonist is what protected her from herself, from her emotions while she was in the FARC. So for her, it was a little bit of a game. Um, I, I don't know, maybe this answers the question. Um, I just, I think back to little snippets that I have in here because I just had the readings. Yeah. Um, but she says, um, as a way of an apology, Leonor said, when you leave the gorilla, your mind has been worked on. So you say sort of what seems convenient. You ask me things. I said, uh-huh, see, but also because I didn't know exact answers. Um, so, so for her to talk to me was a, uh, a way also to organize her memory for herself. If every few months someone's calling you and said, well, you said in March that this happened, that this really happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you also said that your mother this. So it, it starts to organize in her thoughts as well. Okay. So I have to ask. Has she got a copy of her copy of the book? No. So I, I haven't reached out to her recently because it, it's also about space for her. Um, so she did have, she was part of um, a book that came out a few years ago. It was called The Children of War. It was many, many years ago. I'm not sure if that, I, I, I'm not sure, but she was one of the uh, girls, one of the teenagers profiled in the book and the book came back to her hometown and it caused her a lot of problems with her family because of things she had just randomly said when the writer the reporter very much a journalist didn't really understand <laughs> that at that moment as she describes to me in the book she was going through problems with booze and drugs and blah, 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 just say whatever comes to mind, whatever said, whatever this. So it was done in a very crushing sort of way, what she said, what she stated. And even though it was a uh, protected, like another another name, same like her name is not Leonor, by another name, it was still very easy to understand who she is if you know her. Is she, uh, she's, uh, she's clean now? Who knows? Yeah, it's very difficult to be clean. Yeah, after all, you know, even for somebody with not that much post-traumatic stress. When she was in that that so let's say the halfway house after sort of reintegration. Now, first of all, she was captured or she ran away from the park. Uh, there were incidents where she ran away and they uh, found her and brought her back several incidents um and then in the last one she was captured captured by uh, government counter guerrilla soldiers huh. and brought back to uh the army base and then the ombudsman showed up it was very clear by her body that she was underage and so they brought her to bogota to the halfway home and i mean they have they had presumably some sort of psychosocial help Oh, yes. Oh, okay. so, so one thing to be clear is that under the Pastrana government, it was the beginning of the reintegration program because there was a lot of international pressure from the UN and the international community to help children and help minor, minors and to uphold children's rights. So under the Pastrana government, um, it was a more holistic more effort put into the program 
And as the years advanced, she now says, I was very lucky to have been part of that program. It was a beautiful part of my life that allowed me to regain love for life and to be have the time to be a child again. But now I must tell you that the program that they have is just someone signing a piece of paper and off you go. Um, she, oh, sorry, she went through, oh my goodness, sorry. She went through several, she went through several halfway homes. Okay. Um, uh, it, they, uh, it was great because they were all throughout the country in Bogota, then she went to Giron, then she went to Florida Blanca, then back to Bogota, back to different neighborhoods in Bogota that are so different. Um, so she was also able to see Colombia in a different light from the Putumayo way that she was used to. I, mean, I, I always asked again, I know I asked last time, did you get to go into the one of these houses or some of them? Uh, yes, the one in Bogota I spent a lot of time in. The, her first. Yeah, I always, I always, I, I like to imagine what they, what they look like. Can you describe? They look like an old house that they have turned into a dormitory. Mm. There's a TV room. There's a dining room. There's the regular kitchen. It's an old house that we don't know that that house is the one that is the end, the the dormitory for them hmm. the halfway home hmm. where and the neighbors aren't even supposed to know that's what it's, that's what it's an old house it, it could be a just a house yeah a regular house <laughs> and now i mean you were talking about pastrana in the book did you did you get to speak to the former president about all of this no, that was not my focus. He gets okay. an, this is this is really an effort to give voice to somebody who does not have a voice. But you did speak to Vera Grave. I did speak to Vera Grave, but that was in a more personal light okay. as to myself. Um, I also wanted to speak to Vera Grave because she herself was a female in a armed group dominated by men. Yeah. If we uh, put it into context, Vera Grave is a high ranking uh, member of the M19, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So Petro's group, uh, President Petro's group, but Vera Grave has since, you know, obviously gone through all the processes and is now very much an advocate for peace and so on. So what was the conversation like with her? We talked a lot about her life, what motivated her, what made her join, why. Um, she describes to me a lot that it was the moment in time with Trotsky and the Cuban Revolution. And it was a, a world event sort of thing that she was enamored by with peace and equality and Vietnam and hippies and the Beatles and whatnot um, that grabbed her. But I, I spent many, many, many years thinking, but Veda could have just as easily in another setting been a very good United Nations official. She's really intelligent she's capable she got caught up in something that she didn't know where she fit in just uh, she she went to los andes then she went to la nacional the two universities um she was caught in this limbo where she's german mm -hmm. um she's very musical um very uh kind of artsy in a way as a child i envision her she really didn't to me like if you read her the way i guess i came to understand her um she didn't she got lost a little bit you see i mean the 
the difference, obviously, between Leonor and Peregrave is, is obviously huge, right? Um, but again, it, from a, a women's perspective, you know? Right. So, so there are also many commanders, women in the FARC, yes. correct? And there's uh, Tiro Fijo's wife, who's now a congresswoman. Mm -hmm. But the way Leonor told it, none of those women would have cared about her situation and about her life. They wouldn't have done anything for her because they were watching out for themselves. It's not, to them, it wasn't about women's rights. The group talks a lot, the way Leonor explained it, and the way we know it, talks a lot about the collective, about the group, about we're all equal, all of that. But no, they're not. None of those women would have spoken up and been like, you're raping that child every single night. Because then that affects them, that affects their position, that affects their power, their bargaining chip. Survival. Survival, exactly. And and of course, none you know that I know of have have. Uh, are there are there were there women in the secretariat of the FARC? No, 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 no. So why Beta was so special and to get to speak to her because mm -hmm. she was a top ranking commander. She contributed to the mm -hmm. to the the talk, the dialogue, the decisions, the all of that. Um, but aside from that, Richard, it was really important for me to kind of connect with Vera because the M19 was the reason I was not allowed to be Colombian and grow up as a Colombian. The M19, Petro's group, the current president's group, was the reason that I left. It, they displaced me and forbade me from being a full 100% Colombian contributing to the country. So that was one of the things that we talked about with Vera, and I think we connected really well in our common empathy and humanity. And she's clearly said, I can't deny that you don't have empathy, that you're not one of these people that we always labeled as the oligarchy, the enemy. <laughs> I mean, who, who could you say that spent 19 years trying to understand somebody from the FARC? I, they, they, Vera and her group, President Petro's group, don't like me simply because of the neighborhood where I was born. Mm -hmm. And that gave them the right to say to me that I did not belong in Colombia, that yeah. I had to be forced out, that I had to be kidnapped, that there had to be violence against me. It, Does it, that yeah. <laughs> seem I, I, I find it obviously and she went to los Andes, which of course is she incredibly to... privileged yes so um how did she respond to this when you said you know you displaced me she said i'm very very sorry that things w were the way they were but a lot of things still have to change and of course they do look at your north life of course they do Um, and she, I, I uh, brought her her book, which I recommend to everyone. I think it's only in Spanish. I think it's called Razones de Vida, Vera Grave. It's an incredible book. Everyone should read it. And uh, she signed it to Paula with lots of love to a young woman with open eyes or something like that. <laughs> But I mean, she has to recognize through the work that you're doing that you are also working for change in Colombia. Exactly. Um, exactly. And 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 Richard, I've thought about this a lot too. It's so sad the brain drain that happens with so many people who could contribute to Colombia having to leave with the brain drain, the education. It's it's been a constant. That's the truth. Yes. It's been a constant. I, when you, I mean, we look at Vera Grave's life now. I've spoken to her on a couple of occasions. Well, the, the best occasion was when she called me because she wanted to speak to an English person about the uh, the Queen's funeral, 
That's um, <laughs> it was just great. It was just one of those bizarre moments in life. And I'm like, it's really Verda Grave calling me because she really wanted to discuss this. Um, it's like a national personality. She is, you know, and she's respected in her commentary and to have lived through what she has lived. Uh, this is not to condone the behavior uh, of, of the past um and now to think of her life now dedicated um if we can't circle back then you know we know what your life as an author displaced from that period not 100 percent colombian then we know of vera grave's life what of leonor's life right now uh in terms of how sh how she is now yes so she's back in her hometown. Um, she's back living uh, with her family or near her family. Um, the last time we spoke, she had a live-in boyfriend. Um, she's the mother of two girls who must be in their late teens by now. Um, she understands the setbacks of going back to her community. Because she's gone through a lot of therapy and self-awareness, but she went back to a community that's the same. She went back to a community that um, is still FARC, is still drugs. It's only getting worse and worse. Um, still with a lot of poverty, a lot of, a lot of lack of state in hospitals, um, she doesn't have daycare that she could have the ability to go do something else. She, even because of her own experience, she doesn't want to leave her little girls alone for a long time mm -hmm. or with them or with someone else. Um, so that's where she is or was the last time that we, uh, were able to connect thoroughly. I have a question there on that one. Do you think that her trauma is passed on to her her daughters? Oh, of course. Don't aren't, don't we have the same trauma as our parents? As a well, father, are you passing on the trauma to your son. <laughs> well, my sons, I would hope I'm not, but I'm sure I am. <laughs> of course, we are. Of course, they. Of course. But hers is so much more extreme. Yours is so much more extreme. I've never gone through any of these things, so. so it's, <laughs> I think it's the history of all Colombians, though. It's in the trauma is in the DNA. It's not just Lenore. It's not me. It's not just Veda. It's it's all Colombians. This is I, uh, this has been going on since the beginning of Colombia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do believe that the whole family, the whole family, the whole well, the whole Colombian family, the whole population does suffer. The whole from population. I mean. Uh, PTSD. Colonialism, then we've got the War of the Thousand Days that recycled mm. itself into La Violencia, the 1940s. Then the drug wars. Now this. The, uh, yeah. From the uh, Thousand Day War, they used to bury the arms in the, in the ground <laughs> out in the countryside. And they went and dug them up for La Violencia. Can't you see that still happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but the 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 practice of of burying or hiding the arms it's all over as well in in, in, in the country uh, and uh, the world. Um, it's it, yeah. I mean, everyone here is suffering from PTSD. I I, I, I don't know where the way forward is. Is but I, I think I think we've covered a lot of ground, Paul. <laughs> it's aside from suffering from uh ptsd as a country colombians don't believe in shrinks no. <laughs> do you know that from living there right <laughs> yeah well i have a friend who's a forensic you know scientist who goes out and does these horrible jobs and and she told me we don't get psychological help afterwards and i'm like you, you're out there exhuming bodies from whomever, and there is no help to talk you down and help you 
I'd not come to terms with it, but you know, obviously, <laughs> what would you say? Digest what you're going through, and there's no help. So, so I I've lived my whole adult life in New York City, and it's quite the opposite. It really is a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Woody Allen got it right. <laughs> well, Paula. I'm going to, I guess I have your book is en route to me. I will read it. Of course, I'll mention it out there on the uh, on social media once it's out. When you're in Colombia, you will sign it for me, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> That's part of bringing this book out. You well, I just yeah, I'm just a, a voice in the wilderness, but I do believe in these things. And so everybody go online. Look for the book. Leonor, the story of a lost childhood. Paula Delgado Kling. And look, I'll just read it again what Kirkus Review wrote. A devastating portrait of unspeakable suffering, but it goes in. It's all totally corroborated. It goes into the life of a young girl, essentially, I would say, forced, stolen, kidnapped to be in the FARC from 11 years of age. Her story followed 19 years of investigation and research. So this is incredibly in-depth, but puts it into context in the Colombia as well. It's a question, as we talked about Vera Grave, it's a question of time and what's going on around you at the same point. It's, I can't wait to read it, Paula. Oh, Richard, thank you. I can't wait to hear back if you liked it well i will i as soon as i put it on amazon you'll get a review on that don't worry i'm sure it'll be great um <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you need my review though you're in l magazine you uh, I, before oh. long you'll be in the new york times <laughs> so um so let me take this moment what, what is your author website paula it's paula delgado cling.com yeah. Del so that's where you can keep up to date with book launches, appearances, readings, signings, and so on. Because there will be one in Colombia at some point. I'm also on Instagram, Paula at Paula Delgado Kling on Instagram okay. and on Facebook. All right, so there's no excuse. Uh, Paula is everywhere. So let me take this moment. Thank you again for sharing this story, Leonor's story, uh, and being so open and unselfish with this knowledge and it's the weight of history that you are sharing with us oh richard thank you thank you for having me again thank you no it's a it's a real pleasure these are things that i i truly love to to talk about because i see that if the more we talk about it the more that we discuss these things the more open the conversation can become uh that's my feeling in the end but anyhow we should say thank you so much to paula delgado Kling. this has been episode 504 of the Columbia Calling podcast. If you choose to support us, just go to www.patreon.com forward slash Columbia Calling. And now we'll end and go over to some words from our sponsors. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye.